and going there. And so um, we will be sending you the link in case you want to watch it again. And we'll also send it out if you want to share it with any family members or friends or obviously for anybody who's missing this. It's going to be housed on our website. So this series is called Prepare for Victory. It's our virtual medical symposium series. Uh, we created this program because we want to give you, no matter where you are in the world, the opportunity to hear the best information on genetic aortic conditions from our professional advisory board and other leading medical experts on these conditions like we have tonight. Um, we are grateful to the Chu and Chan Foundation for making these webinars possible. Before we get to our presentation on vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, uh, we have Michael Weimer, the President and CEO of the Marsan Foundation, and he would like to welcome you all. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, greetings, everyone. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes, um, give a little historical perspective on our involvement. Uh, this past uh, April, or I, I think it was actually early May, uh, the Defy Foundation uh, sponsored their second uh, international research conference. Um, and it happened to be aligned with the Marfan Foundation and our scientific conference. And um, Joe Grima and I were there, Joe's our chief science officer and, and others, and we had a chance to participate in the meeting and walked away with the uh, commitment to try to do something that would uh, be supportive of the vascular EDS community. Uh, we share many of the same medical leaders, uh, as you probably know, Peter Byers, Hal Dietz, um, Shane and uh, Shireen with us this evening. And a lot of people that have vascular EDS feel uh, closer to the Marfan Foundation uh, than others, you know, which is absolutely great. And so we really, we left the conference with the idea we would begin to do things that we believed were supportive of the community. Uh, one of the first things we did, we made a decision to uh, launch a vascular EDS track at our annual conference. And Rachel Taze, a member of the community, and Sarah Jeffs, our uh, advisors uh, on our annual conference planning committee. Uh, Shane Morris, uh, who's with us this evening, has uh, really been the leader in putting together this year's annual conference, which will be held in, uh, in Houston in July. And we really hope that uh, folks, families, individuals uh, that, have, that have vascular EDS will come out and spend the weekend with us. Uh, there's a clinic, there's uh, opportunity to see all kinds of different professionals. There's a, a lot of uh, different programs that are supportive of everyone's needs. And I think Eileen's actually going to talk a little bit about the conference at the end of this uh, a little bit later on. But it's July 11th through 14th in, uh, in Houston, as I mentioned. What we're really attempting to do, I think, is work towards uh, establishing a larger vascular EDS movement, uh, particularly here in the States. Um, I often kid people, I would like to see the V be a capital V instead of a small V. My <laughs> others probably feel that way as well. Uh, we're actually working on uh, providing the vascular EDS community with identity. Uh, we're working on establishing uh, a website uh, that would also be supportive of, of this movement. But I think in reality, you know, the only thing that will allow us to really be successful in building a larger community would be the active engagement and support of the VETS community. So uh, I would urge you to reach out to any of us, Eileen, myself, Joe. Um, I'm not hard to find. I think my, hope my email may be up on the screen right now. I can't see it exactly what's there, but we would love to have people engage around uh, what we're trying to build and become really the leaders of what we ultimately uh, do build. Um, our chief science officer and I will also be at the uh, ACER community advisory team meeting in early April. So if anyone is planning on attending that, um, we welcome the opportunity to say hello. Uh, but please know that uh, we're here to do whatever we can possibly do uh, within our resources and in the platform we build uh, to be supportive of the community. That's the end game. The only thing we're really interested in is uh, being as supportive of the patients as we possibly can uh, organizationally. So with that background, I will kick it back to you, Eileen. Great, thank you so, thank you so much, Michael, and I'm glad that you could join us tonight. 
Um, so before we go on to the presentation, I just want to let you all know that um, the presenters are going to leave plenty of time at the end for your questions. And so I'd like you to do is just type them into the Q&A box. That's what we'll be looking later on. Um, you might want to wait until the end because maybe your questions will be answered later on. But um, we are going to get those at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, um, let me just, okay. So our, um, our two speakers tonight are Dr. Shireen Shalub and um, Dr. Shane Morris. Dr. Shalhoub is a vascular surgeon and an associate professor of surgery at the University of Washington in Seattle. She is a translational researcher with a focus on individuals with heritable aortopathies and arteriopathies. She is the lead principal investigator for the PCORI Award that created the Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Collaborative to bridge the gap between the genetics of VEDS and patient-centered outcomes research. Dr. Shane Morris is an associate professor of pediatrics cardiology at Baylor College of Medicine and a pediatric cardiologist at Texas Children's Hospital. And she's also the medical director of cardiovascular genetics. A large part of her clinical practice is caring for children and young adults with genetic aortic conditions, including VEDS, Marsan, and Lois Beats. She co-directs the cardiovascular genetics clinic, which provides comprehensive diagnosis, counseling, and cardiovascular management for young people with genetic conditions and cardiovascular disease. Her research interests align with her clinical interests and focus primarily on improving outcomes for children with genetic aortic conditions. Her primary goal is to prevent adverse outcomes in patients with aortic disease so that they can live long and healthy lives. Um, as, as Michael mentioned, she is going to be hosting our annual conference this summer, and we will talk about that a little bit more later. So with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and give the remote control over to... Um, Oops, I just lost that there. Here, no, I, I oh, it. I got it. I just took it. You got it? I think, well. I am going to, yep, get over to. Are we good? Mars. We are good. All right, should you, everyone can see that? Great. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I recognize a lot of the names on the call, and I'm really excited that the Marfan Foundation is hosting this. Uh, we're going to do this in two parts. Um, I'm going to do the first part and talk mostly about genetics and presentation and management in children. And Dr. Shelhoub is going to speak after me um, more about adult phenotype and more detailed surgical management uh, and what, with some additional genetic details. We will have a little bit of overlap, but sort of our different perspectives from pediatric and the adult world. So first of all, so we're going to, like I said, we're going to talk about genetics, what affects children with VEDS, and management of children with VEDS. So first of all, what is vascular EDS? And I know there's a large range of knowledge about this on the call, so we're starting pretty basic, but hopefully we'll get a little more detailed. So basically, vascular EDS is a genetic condition. It, we don't really know the prevalence, but the estimations, depending who you talk to or who you hypothesize with, are between 1 in 50,000, 1 in 200,000 people. And it's a rare subtype of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, called, also called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, type 4 in the past, um, basically, that's caused by a mutation in the CAL3A1 gene, which encodes part of type 3 collagen. So collagen basically is a fiber-like protein that's in all of our bodies, all over our bodies, and the type 3 collagen is found in connective tissue, including skin, lung, uterus, intestine, and the vascular system. And this is a picture of what type 3 collagen looks like on the right. And you can imagine if this structure is not formed correctly, it can cause major problems in all of these tissues. So this is, if you look here, this is what a collagen peptide looks like, and then you get this triple-stranded helix to make your collagen molecule, and then you line up a bunch of these to get your collagen fibril, and this forms a lot of parts of our tissues. And again, if this is abnormal, this can cause a lot of abnormalities, including poor wound healing. So what are the genetics? It's basically autosomal dominant. And so what that means is you just need one affected gene to have the disease. So in autosomal recessive conditions, that's when you get a copy from each parent, those are different. This, you just need one affected gene to have the disease. And most people who have a pathogenic mutation will have features of vascular EDS. Now, people who have it can get it from one parent or it can be spontaneous, and that's called de novo. And about 50% of call 3 one mutations we see are inherited from an affected parent, and about 50% are de novo. However, if you inherit it, even if you're de novo, you still have a 50% chance of passing it on. So what about vascular EDS in children? So the most common identified feature, or the most common reasons for testing that we see, and also this is reported in literature, most commonly is family history. 
as we'll talk about in a little bit, a lot of people present undiagnosed with a major event. And so then once they're diagnosed, they often go to their younger children or relatives and get tested. So over half of who we see for testing presents because of a family history. The majority of other children present with features, and that can include easy bruising, hematomas, which are big, very large bruises under the skin, thin skin, or joint hypermobility. And the first presentation with a critical event is pretty rare in children, although it does happen. And a common theme, I've definitely seen this in many of my patients um, and is reported as well, it's common for child abuse to be suspected given the significant bruising in some cases. A common presentation is that a two or three year old comes with bruises all over their body and that are excessive and someone reports that child to CPS and they get a hematologic workup. Hematology then re refers them onto genetics or cardiology. So oh, how can they present? Another way they can present is infants or newborns can actually pre present with some congenital anomalies. Club foot is actually present in about 8% where kids are born with this, a more mild, this is in the spectrum of hind foot malformation, but this is the more severe form. And they can also be born with hip dislocations or actually amniotic band syndrome or limb deficiency where part of a limb is missing from in utero and we think that's due to a problem with the amniotic sac from the vascular EDS. Now, what's most common is this thin translucent skin where the veins are visible beneath the skin, especially on the chest and abdomen. And then also you can see this premature aging. You can see it in the hands. So this is a young child, but you can see that the hands look quite aged. And they also have skin that, they can have skin that can be soft, but it doesn't tend to be very stretchy like we see in classical Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Other possibilities, we can see joint hypermobility, although certainly not to the extent that's in hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. There can be easy tearing of the tendons and muscles. They can develop painful swollen veins in the legs and slow wound healing following injury or surgery. So the facial features at, that are pretty common are these protruding or deep set eyes, thin pinched nose and lips, sunken cheeks, and a small chin. So if we're seeing someone in clinic who has easy bruising, this is one of the first things we look for to see what our suspicion is for vascular Ehlers-Danlos, but of course not everyone has these features. So what are complications that occur in children? Well, one of the more common complications is a pneumothorax, and pneumo just means lung, thorax means chest, but this is just a collapsed lung in the chest. You can see this diagram here where you get air basically in the chest, and that causes this lung that doesn't have any more to be collapsed and can cause a child to have significant breathing difficulty. This is also, as Shereen will talk about, is common in adults as well, but patients will present with acute either chest pain or difficulty breathing, or their oxygen levels will be low. Other complications can include hernias, and inguinal hernia is a groin hernia. These are very common, and they can actually have recurrent joint subluxations or dislocations, and that's when the joint, when it should normally be in socket, sort of comes out of socket, and it can happen in the knees or the hips or some of the more common dislocations or shoulders. Now, we, this isn't that common in children, but can occur is intestinal rupture, and I think Shireen's gonna talk a little bit about, more about this, but this is a diagram of the gastrointestinal system. This is the stomach the small intestine and the large intestine, and spontaneous ruptures or ruptures with minimal trauma are, can occur in children, are though not that uncommon, or not that common, but can occur and certainly is an emergency. Now, the complications we worry most about in children are vascular complications. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, and Shane's gonna talk about this later, the difference between an aneurysm, a dissection, and a rupture. And this is a diagram of the vascular system we, that sort of hit, this is the aorta, the main artery of the body, and then this aorta feeds the vessel to the brain, the arms, and the rest of the body. So what is an aneurysm? An aneurysm is where part of an artery or the aorta, which is the largest artery, is dilated or enlarged. So these are two examples. This is a root dilation or aneurysm here, and this is an ascending aortic aneurysm here. Now, neither of these are what we commonly see in vascular EDS. This kind is what we commonly see in Marfan syndrome and Lois Dietz syndrome, but this is an aneurysm. Now these are not that, aortic aneurysms centrally are not that common in vascular Ehlers Danlos, but they can have aneurysms all through the rest of the arterial tree. Now a dissection is different. A dissection is when there's a tear. Now the arterial wall has three layers, sort of layers right around here, and when one or two of those layers is torn and blood goes into that layer, it can create this false lumen and that is a dissection. So this can cause acute pain, and again, Shireen will talk a little bit more about that, but that's the difference. An aneurysm is not a tear. An aneurysm is just a dilation and is totally asymptomatic, no symptoms. A dissection 
typically is associated with pain or hemodynamic instability, but not always. And especially if it's in the smaller vessels, they'll have more. They'll be more stable. Now, a rupture is when the whole wall is torn through. All three layers is a rupture where the blood actually escapes the blood vessel. This is a diagram of an aortic rupture where the blood escapes and can go into the chest wall or wherever that blood vessel lives, in the neck or in the brain. And this, this is an emergency. And it, again, if this happens in the aorta, most people do not survive if there's an aortic rupture. Uh, but this is, this is a critical emergency. And this can also occur in beds. Now, when we talk about aortic arterial aneurysm and vascular ADS, again, most patients don't have this classic root aneurysm. So people, and a lot of my pediatric patients come reading about Marfan syndrome and Lewis-Dietz syndrome that look like this, but this is not how most patients with vascular ADS. I think I only have one person in my practice that has a root aneurysm, and we think it's for different reasons. And therefore, it's really hard to, fo we follow this in Marfan and Lewis-Dietz to see their risk of dissection, but patients with VEDS typically dissect without these aneurysms. We can't rely on those to predict who's going to dissect or rupture. So, and just to, Shreen again is going to talk a little bit about more imaging, but we in pediatric practice are trying to look for aneurysms to see if there's anything that needs to be addressed. And we can't really see these with x-ray. And if we look at echo, we can only see the first part of the aorta, the aortic root. So we typically perform serial CT scanning or MRI scanning, which is these three-dimensional pictures of the aorta. Now, when we're thinking about them in children, a CT scan is very fast. It gives excellent pictures, but it, um, but it does require radiation. An MRI gives excellent pictures, but in children under 9 or 10 usually requires sedation. So it's often a balance for us which one we think. Now, for my older kids, I almost always recommend an MRI because they can sit there without sedation. So now, can we predict the course? If I see a patient in clinic, can we figure out how they're, they're going to do? Well, in some ways, a little bit. So the specific type of mutation may matter, how it alters the type 3 collagen. So if the mutation has less than 15% of expected levels, it's if, if it's thought to not produce much, they're more likely to have gut or uterine involvement, and they can have a younger age at first event. And this is from Dr. Shalhoub's work. And if we actually look at the mutation type, we can look at mortality. Now, we're gonna, you're going to see a lot of these graphs, both in mine and Dr. Shalhoub's, um, talks. This is called a Kaplan-Meier graph. So what this does is this looks over some amount of time. So in this, this is age and this is survival and everyone starts off alive. This is 100% survival and it sees how fast people drop off. So you can draw a line if you want to say what percent of patients had, had died by age 40. You can put a line right here and you say, okay, those patients with null mutation, about 10% had died. But if you look here and you say patients with a glycine substitution or a splice acceptor site, then that's more like 70 or 30 percent had died, and the most severe one are these splice donor sites. So we can't. The patients who are null or haploinsufficient tend to have a more mild course. Now the good news about this is survival in children with vascular EDS is very high, and events are pretty low, and ch kids tend to survive events. This is a curve from uh, Pepin et al. paper led by Dr. Byers. This is a national. These are national survival curves for the United States, where we would typically predict. It's that same kind of graph I just showed you. And these are patients with vascular EDS. So if you draw a line at 18, you can see that very few patients have had a lethal event by age 18, less than 5%. And that's, that's really great for me and for my practice because most of our patients do really well in the pediatric period. So the good news, too, is that even though surgery on the aorta and other vessels is difficult, it can be successful. And these are just a list of some case reports and a couple of my own patients where surgery has been successful in children and they've done really well. I know there's a lot of fear about surgery and we often try to avoid it, but it can be done if you're with the right team. So also watching can work, too. There's, there's several examples where no intervention has been done for smaller vessel dissections. This is actually a femoral dissection that was monitored and had close imaging follow-up and did not require surgery. Now I'm going to talk a little bit in my last few minutes about medication. So what can we do? Um, we're going to talk about soliprolol. So soliprolol um, is a medication that there is potentially some benefit in patients with vascular EDS, and we use this even in children. This is the front page of a study done in 2010 that was published in The Lancet, and it's basically a study comparing soliprolol to placebo in patients with vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And what they did, they studied soliprolol. Now this is a beta blocker. So beta blockers in general are medicines that are most commonly used for blood pressure. They also slow the heart rate. And this, this Silprol is a third generation beta blocker, so it has some more specific effects on the heart and actually causes, can result in the vessels dilating. So it has kind of two effects. 
and they enrolled 53 patients in several centers in Europe, and they assigned them to either ciliprolol or placebo. And there was a range, range of ages, although most were adults, and they increased the medicine as tolerated, and they followed the patients for five years. Now, um, there was 25 patients in one group and 28 in the placebo group, and they looked at how many patients had a dissection or a rupture of an artery. And when they looked at this, the patients on the medication, only 20% had an event over the five-year period, and the placebo, 50%. And this was a significant difference. So this was a potentially very good result, saying that maybe this medication significantly helps this population. These are their graphs. This is freedom from events. This is another one of those Kaplan-Meier curves. So this is the start of the study. Everyone's alive. Everyone's together. And you see that the control group, those are the patients not on meds, dropped more rapidly than the other group. Now, there, there's a few problems with this trial. It was a small number of patients. Not everyone actually had molecular testing. There's some concern that some of the more severe patients are in the control arm. So it'd be wonderful to have more studies, but this is what we have sort of available right now. So the conclusions that the authors came up with the studies is that ciliparol might be the treatment of choice for physicians aiming to present, prevent major complications in patients with beds. Now, the problem is in the United States, we don't have access to ciliparol. So we tend to use, at least in my practice, and we'll see what Shreen does, but two other third-generation beta blockers, including labetalol or, um, or carvedilol, although their mechanism of action is slightly different than ciliparol. So just to, to tidy up, our strategy at Texas Children's when we see patients is we confirm the genetic diagnosis. We perform cascade screening, which means testing the relatives to make sure everyone's diagnosed. We do baseline head to pelvis imaging, usually using uh, MRI. And uh, then we ensure families that are educated about risk and warning signs. We make emergency plans. We do do some activity limitations for older children, but not younger children. We almost universally start beta blocker therapy, like I said, using labetalol. Oh, I wrote ciliprolol. That should be carvedilol. And um, we do serial imaging depending on severity. Some of my more severe patients or patients had events. We do yearly, yearly imaging. Some others will space it out. We minimize procedure, and if needed, we make sure we have an educated, prepared team. And we try to connect the family with other families so that they have some support. And so basically, in summary, from my perspective, and we'll switch over to Shireen, vascular EDS is rare but serious, caused by a problem with collagen formation. The common features are thin translucent skin, easy bruising, and aged hands and feet. And it's most commonly picked up in kids due to family history, easy bruising, club foot, hip dislocations, and skin findings. And the best way to evaluate for what we're looking for is a CT scan or MRI. Knowing the diagnosis of vascular EDS can improve outcomes. Surgery can be done, although we try to avoid it. And ciliparol, a beta blocker medication, may prevent adverse events, but the jury's still out since we don't have a ton of data out there yet. And I think that is it for me. I think we can probably now switch over to Shireen to focus more on adult pathology. So I think you just stop share. Shireen, oh, stop share, yes, thank stop you. Stop share, and then um, yep, got it. Shireen, you can grab that, right? Okay, let me open it here. All right, do you have that up? Perfect, thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Shane. That was that was an amazing introduction, and it laid really, a lot of the things that I will talk about are repetitious, but repetition is mother of retention, so we're gonna go through this. So what I'm going to talk about are the pathology and features of vascular EDS in adults. I will spend some time talking about why accurate diagnosis really matters in, this, in these cases, and we'll cover management principles. Um, I will not be talking about specifically the surgical repairs. Those will be uh, covered in a separate webinar. That's what Eileen and I were talking about earlier. And then I will talk about how I screen for arterial pathology in, uh, in our patients. This is for people to review. Again, we're starting with different levels of knowledge. So there are diagnostic criteria uh, that are clinical criteria to diagnose vascular EDS. And uh, this is a good reference to have. Uh, which is the 2017 International Classifications of Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Uh, but in a nutshell, there are major criteria and there are minor criteria. The major criteria include a family history and somebody who has a causative variant in the culture A1 gene that uh, Shane was talking about, uh, as well as if they had presented with an arterial rupture at a young age, a spontaneous sigmoid colon rupture without any other causes, uh, or uterine rupture during pregnancy. Carotid cavernous sinus fistulas, I'll show you some pictures and explain what that is, but if that occurs, it's also highly suggestive of vascular EDS. There are minor criteria, which I will cover. Uh, Shane already covered quite a bit of them, but I'll go through those as well. 
And I like this picture here. This is a microscopy picture of tissue from control, meaning somebody who does not have vascular EDS. And this, on this side here, you see somebody who has vascular EDS. And what it's showing is a magnified view of what collagen looks like uh, in the tissue. And you can see that people who have vascular EDS, or this patient here, has what we call disorganized collagen. So this is how the defective collagen looks. And that tells you when you see this loose packing of collagen, it makes sense why the tissue is, is weaker. And the pathologies that we see are predominantly the pneumothorax or hemothorax, the bowel perforation, and the arterial and aortic events. So pneumothorax, uh, Shane has talked about that already, which is basically the collapsed lung, usually with air. That occurs in about 14% of people with vascular EDS, uh, similar to Marfan syndrome, where about 14% of Marfan syndrome uh, individuals can also have spontaneous pneumothoraces. And these are things that happen without any trauma, and the patient usually comes in with shortness of breath and chest pain. There's also hemothorax, meaning blood in the lung, in this Base as well. This is an example of a woman who was in her 60s when she had a spontaneous hemothorax, and you can see it here. There's blood around the lung, and then we diagnosed her with vascular EDS. So it was a late presentation of vascular EDS. One of the things we have shown both in two separate cohorts. So this is a manuscript that just came out in um, that we just published, and this is another manuscript that's under review. So separate population of vascular EDS. And in both cohorts, what we have found is that the pneumothorax occurred at a younger age, so in this case, the mean age of 25 years, compared to arterial rupture, where the mean age was 37 years. And so what we had taken away from this is that when somebody comes in with a spontaneous pneumothorax or hemothorax and they are a young person, we should look and keep on our differential diagnosis whether or not we think they have vascular EDS and ask questions and examine them closely. The next thing that we have talked about, we need to talk about is spontaneous gastrointestinal perforation. That means that the bowels um, have a hole in them and the, the contents of the intestines spill into the belly. That usually presents with belly pain. And the abdomen is tender and patients will say that it hurts to walk. So as they're taking every step, it's shaking the contents of their abdomen, so that is very painful. So all of these suggest gastrointestinal perforation. This is a nice uh, review, systematic review of a bowel perforation in uh, vascular airless downless syndrome. And what they have shown from the case reports is that sigmoid colon, which is right here uh, in this picture, this is a picture of the colon, and you can see where the arrow is, sigmoid colon is in this area. So that seems to be the most common location of perforation. Uh, however, it can occur in other parts of the bowel as well. They've also shown that in people who have perforation and have surgery, and if the bowels are connected in that same original surgery, that there's a higher risk of having reperforation again and versus what um, you know people describe as colostomy, where you bring part of the bowel to the abdominal wall and not connect the intestines. Um, so that, you know, I'm happy to take questions about that later. We can talk some more about it. So there are aortic and arterial pathology and vascular EDS. There are two papers here, one by uh, Odrich et al. This was a group in Mayo Clinic back uh, in 2005, where they published on 24 patients with vascular EDS and shown they had 132 complications, meaning arterial manifestations. And they drew this very nice graph showing where these uh, aneurysms and dissections have occurred. And as you can see, thoracic aorta does get uh, a, num a reasonable number of quote, events or aneurysms or dissection, but really what's different compared to Marfan syndrome and low EDs is that the rest of the arterial tree is also affected. On the right-hand side is our paper that is now in press where we also looked at uh, patients, 53 individuals with genetically confirmed vascular EDS, and uh, we had 139 events. And you can see that the mesenteric arteries, these are the arteries that feed the small bowels, the intestines, the spleen, the liver, those have the most number of aneurysms and dissections. And then iliac arteries, 40% of the individuals also had iliac artery involvement. And that's fairly unique to vascular EDS compared to the other syndromes. Again, in yellow, you can see the aortic involvement, but it is less than what we see in the other syndromes. So to describe, describe what aneurysms are, an aneurysm, by simplest definition, is a dilation of the artery to more than one and a half size than normal. So that dilation can look as a fusiform. This is a picture of somebody who has an abdominal aortic aneurysm. You can see that it dilates the whole aorta. Whereas facular aneurysms are these berry-looking things where they just pop up on the side of the artery. 
Below them here, I'm giving you two examples from CT scans. This is somebody who has an iliac artery aneurysm. You can see at the arrow how the iliac artery on the right side, on the right side is larger, uh, the left side is larger than the right side. And then here, this is a celiac artery aneurysm, but this is that very aneurysm configuration, so this is a saccular aneurysm. And the reason we care is because aneurysms are usually asymptomatic. They don't cause any pain. But when they rupture, they're definitely very painful because they're causing now internal bleeding. And it is a severe sudden onset pain. So when the wall is too weak to contain the blood anymore, it does rupture. And this is, again, a CT scan of somebody who had an abdominal aortic aneurysm, but also had a dissection. I'll show you some slides of dissection. So they had both aneurysm and dissection and had the rupture. So in contrast, dissections, what a dissection means is it's a tear in the liner of the artery or the aorta. And that tear, this is called an intimal flap, where the, it now becomes a double barrel. So I'm going to show you, this is a picture of an intravascular ultrasound. This is a small probe that we put inside the aorta to look at the walls of the aorta. And you can see that it looks like a double barrel. And I'm going to play this video here and show you what that looks like. You can see here how this intimal flap is moving. So this came off of this wall here and moved to the middle, and the blood is flowing on both sides of that. This is an example of an aorta with a type B aortic dissection, meaning descending thoracic aortic dissection. And if you were to cut it across, you can see how it looks like there's double channels. But again, in vascular airless illness syndrome, we see it, again, these dissections in the small arteries. So this is an example of a tear in a celiac artery. And down here, you can see an iliac artery dissection compared to, for example, this iliac artery, which does not have a dissection. Carotid cavernous fissure, like I said, if this happens in the setting outside of trauma, then there, it must definitely lead to investigating uh, vascular stainless as a pathology. This is an abnormal communication between the carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. This is in the, in the skull, basically, behind uh, the eyeball where they would connect. And the way it presents is with a bulging eye that's usually red and painful, uh, and abnormal eye movements because it causes all that swelling causes impingement on the nerves, so they have people have trouble moving their eye. And this is an example of somebody who had coils put in there, this black stuff is coils, uh, to seal that leak. So this is something that is uh, definitely one of the major diagnostic criteria for vascular EDS. In terms of facial features, in our series, we've had now two series, and you can see about 60% of them, 60% of the individuals are described as having facial features, which means that 40% do not have the classic facial features. So you cannot only rely on a physical exam to say that somebody has vascular illness analyst syndrome. Other physical exam findings is the thin skin with visible veins, as you can see here, as well as the aging, premature aging in the hand that Shane has mentioned. The other thing I look for is if they have any scars, like this person here, where you can see that they have a broad-based scar, and that's a marker of uh, delayed healing or, or not perfect healing, and that's why it has this, this wide-based scar. So do we see physical findings of vascular illness in everybody? And the answer is no. Uh, the most common one is easy bruising with 64%. Uh, in this particular cohort, facial features were only described in 31%, and then translucent skin about half of half the people. So I would argue that it matters that we diagnose this accurately, not only because you can't diagnose it only clinically, but you need to supplement it with genetic testing, but there's also overlap with Marfan syndrome and Lois Dietz syndrome. So Marfan syndrome and Lois Dietz syndrome have the aortic root aneurysm, which Shane talked about, whereas vascular EDS is less likely to have that. But there are other features like the hypermobile joints and pneumothoraces. And so this is important that we differentiate between these syndromes. And also, there's this genotype-phenotype correlation, which, again, Shane talked about earlier. And this is yet another type of genotype-phenotype correlation where we have people who have something called haploinsufficiency. This is from the work from Peter Byers. And basically, the, this population, they make half the amount of collagen uh, compared to a very minimal amount of collagen that we see in the most of the other subtypes. And in this particular subtype, the life expectancy is indeed longer, and uh, the, has a delay. The people have delayed onset of arterial manifestations, or none at all. Um, we looked at uh, in our recent series. We looked at again to see if this this really was a phenomenon that we had observed. And in the paper that Shane mentioned, we did see that. And also in the more recent paper, we looked at people who had large amino acid substitutions because there have been some literature suggesting that that is a more severe phenotype, and it seems that that trend is true. 
the other thing is uh, knowing the risk factor, knowing that somebody has SKDS allows us to aggressively modify their risk factor and tailor the operative techniques. So we have shown before that knowing the diagnosis improves outcomes. Um, and it allows us to create this multidisciplinary care team that is centered around a primary care provider that can take care of the patient and then surrounded by the specialist as needed uh, to support uh, the care. It also has research implications. So for example, in our cohort, again, through the, the Low Frequency Disease Consortium, we had 173 individuals who were clinically diagnosed with vascular EDS, and, but when we looked at their gene mutations, we found that 7% of them had non-pathogenic variants, meaning they did not have vascular EDS. 12% we were not able to get their genetic testing, and 33% were diagnosed by clinical criteria only. So in red are about half of the people in this cohort uh, in red here, you can see that they actually had a mutation that confirmed the diagnosis. So clinical diagnosis alone is not enough. Uh, this leads into the soliprolol trial, which Shane summarized very nicely. I put here the causes of death in each of these groups. And uh, what you can see ultimately is that the soliprolol group had 13 individuals who had confirmed mutation, and in the control group, only 20 individuals with confirmed mutation. And when you only look at those in terms of complications, there was one death in the soliprolol group, so that's 8%, and three deaths in the control group, so 15%. Uh, so it is the best data that we have, uh, but that's what that looks like. So what do I do in clinic? I talk to people about smoking cessation. If they smoke, that has to stop. That's very important. If they have hypertension, I will be aggressively treating their hypertension, and I usually do that with beta blockers, my first agent, uh, and uh, Shane described that beautifully. Daily walking, I tell everybody they have to walk 30 minutes a day, and then I set up a screening program for them, meaning uh, the imaging that Shane talked about, and I'll show you some of that, and then we'll talk to them about testing their family. Other medications, vitamin C. Vitamin C data is anecdotal and based on uh, a reduction in uh, bruising that was observed by uh, separate different groups, and so that's why we recommend vitamin C, but there are no large trials. Daily aspirin is important if somebody has aneurysms and defections. That is the standard of care, uh, and we usually put them on low-dose aspirin. Doxycycline, we have used that in some people who have aneurysms, and this is based on regular aneurysm data, but doxycycline is not something that we use even for regular aneurysms. So there's some animal data and some experimental data, but not not, not enough to make it a, a solid recommendation. I also talk to people about an anti-inflammatory diet. Again, not big data behind it, but I think less inflammation is probably better. In terms of exercise, we do recommend mild aerobic exercise. This is a very elegant work that was done in Marfan mice, uh, and they made them exercise mildly, and that showed that it improved the quality of their aorta. And so I use this to say, you know, we do believe this plus all the vascular literature that supports exercise to say that mild exercise is important. The other thing we talk about is fluoroquinolones. This is a recent FDA warning to say do not use fluoroquinolones in individuals with aneurysms, dissections, or family history of such, including people with syndromes such as vascular EDS and Marfan syndrome. Uh, fluoroquinolones have been shown to increase risk of tendon ruptures, but even more recently, increase of aneurysm ruptures. So avoid fluoroquinolones, and here's the list of them that you can have in reference later. So screening, we use ultrasound. I use a fair bit of ultrasound in the adult practice. The benefit is that it's no radiation involved, and it works everywhere except for the chest. And it gives us very good images of the aneurysms. So that is a nice modality that avoids radiation. CT scans uh, which and MRIs, uh, Shane had spoken about those, and that there are definitely trade-offs, as she had mentioned earlier. And I wanted to show you a picture of a CT scan. This is a person who has vascular EDS with an aneurysm right here in the carotid artery. This is a CT scan. This is the same person on a follow-up, has an MRI, and here's the aneurysm here. So you can see that the quality is quite good on both studies. And again, I do have this discussion with people about what to, which study to order when. So in summary, I think accurate diagnosis is absolutely important. Management principles, again, we follow holistic care. You have to take care of um, everything, not just the surgical components. And the future really is to, that it's important to understand this natural history so that we can guide the therapy that we are doing um, and certainly understanding the phenotype because we definitely see a fair bit of variation and then patients input into research priorities. I will end this by mentioning the Vascular EDS Collaborative, which has, uh, we had started last year and created a lot of relationships with people. And a lot of you who are calling in are part of this virtual research network or the stakeholder group or the advisory group, where it's a large group of people working together uh, under one umbrella to promote the research in vascular EDS. And uh, that's all I have, and I'm happy to take questions, and I'm looking forward to them with you.
Great, thank you, thank you so much. So I'm now going to go back to my screen here. And um, I just wanna take one minute before we go to questions and I'll make this really quick because um, obviously this, this condition is very complicated. You all have very many doctors and a lot of really important medical information that you're keeping track of. So I want to just remind everybody about Backpack Health, which is an app that has some really important functions for you and your family. Um, first, you can put all your inf health information in there and um, for you, your family members, testing results and all that. Um, it's safe, it's secure, it comes in six languages and has great functionality that allows you to share information um, as you wish, whether it's with a school nurse or with your grandparents or taking your kids on vacation, a new doctor, or more importantly, I guess, um, EMTs in emergency situations. So um, it's a really great tool for you. The other really important thing here is that it has an important um, opportunity for research. And everybody knows that's what gives us hope for the future and your information when you consent to be in this international patient registry, the first for these genetic aortic conditions like Marfan and VEDS, um, your information is de-identified, it's aggregated, and um, it's gonna be really useful for families, uh, for researchers in the future, I should say. Um, you can join it through our website, this little, this little backpack icon you'll see on top of our website, marfan.org, free to join. So I wanna make sure you guys all take advantage of that. Um, I also want to make sure you all know, and we'll talk, about, and I'll ask Shane to say a couple words about this too. Um, as Michael mentioned, our annual conference is coming up in Houston this summer, and for the first time we have this VEDS workshop track. Um, you'll see the medical um, session has these presentations, including a research update on VEDS. There's a special oppor social opportunity on Saturday night of conference for, for you and your families. And then the workshops, these are all special, specific just to, um, to VEDS. And so you'll get information exactly for you. Um, Shane, do you wanna just say um, something about the conference while? Oh, sure, we're just really excited to host people. The registration is already open online. We're expecting a, a pretty big turnout. It will be really hot in Houston, but most of our activities will be indoors. Um, it's a really great city to be in. And again, it's, it's also inexpensive, so we, and it's in the middle of the country, so we're expecting a ton of people, and I think it's a great place to, to foster community and meet other people. And I love the idea of having these specific workshops for VEDS, but also that these rooms will have a small number of people so you can meet other people from your community, even though the conference is gonna be so large. So the people with VEDS will likely be a lot of these workshops so you can meet the other families that you haven't met. So I'm really, really excited that they're offering the track this year. Yeah, we're really excited. Thank you so much for hosting, Shane. Sure. Um, so now we go to the question and answer box and let's get some here. So, um, all right, so here we go, anonymous. Um, for one of our two doctors, can adults with beds have weight loss surgery? That is probably more in Shireen's. That is a great question. I mean, in general, I have noticed that vascular EDS patients tend to be um, on the thin side, so I've not encountered that specifically. Um, obviously, I mean, if, if we're talking about that, I think it's worthwhile to discuss that with their surgeon predominantly, and, um, and I'm happy to, to weigh in as well. I mean, that, I have not seen that. I've not seen it reported. Okay. Um, great. Yeah, first one, um, very different. Okay. Um, here's another question. I see that one medication option is a beta blocker, but those patients who also have POTS and low blood pressure should avoid beta blockers. Is that right? And what would they do instead? We, do you want to both tackle this, Shane? Uh, why don't you start with that, Shane? Okay, so, um, well, some people with POTS can't take beta blockers, but some can. I certainly would try it, and there's lots of other solutions for, for helping with POTS, including increased volume intake, salts, other medications that can help, especially for our younger patients that have POTS. And some people have in the past trialed beta blockers in those populations, so I wouldn't be opposed just because they have POTS to giving a beta blocker but I would trial it very carefully. And I would second that. I mean, I, and I don't, this, I personally don't prescribe uh, beta blockers unless they're in the hospital and I'm taking care of them. But in general, I try to set them up with our cardiologist, which would be Shane's adult equivalent uh, to, to set them up on the proper medication. Great, thank you. Um, how do you know if an unknown variant of COL3A1 is VEDS um, and if the person has some, some presentations, spontaneous dissections, hypermobility, prominent eyes, slow healing, with the scarring that you mentioned? Well, you really have to talk to um, most likely a geneticist or if not, another specialist who's really familiar with these disorders to help interpret if the variant is not a pathogenic variant. You know, a genetics lab will come back as 
pathogenic, likely pathogenic, or variant of unknown significance or benign, typically. And if it's in that variant of unknown significance, or you know, if it's benign, it's not. If it's variant of unknown significance, which is very common, it is possible that it's pathogenic and is just unique to your family. But that really takes the art of working with a clinician familiar with this. And sometimes you just can't figure it out. You just have to wait. The real way to test it is doing functional studies in a laboratory, but those are pretty hard to, to come by. And on our end, we I see these um, this population with Peter Byers, who has a lot of experience. And what we have done is we uh, test the family members if we can, um, and then possibly even a skin biopsy to see. It, it is a lot of work to try to sort that out. Um, certainly, I mean, if there's more more symptoms and more events happening, that can also be convincing that possibly this VUS is pathogenic. Uh, but it does take a fair bit of work. Great, thank you. Um, there's a lot in the news about gene therapy. Is that an option here with correcting the col 3 a one gene? Well, I, I think I talked to Peter about this, but I think he would know the most about it. You know, as you guys may not know, but there's this technology called, uh, well, CRISPR technology, which is the first time gene therapy has really seemed to to be effect, highly effective. And what they do is they take, um, they can sort of take someone's, a sample of someone's DNA or cells, and they'll edit the DNA so it's better. So it doesn't have either it's sort of like missing the bad part. They can't make the DNA good again, but they could like cut out call 3A1, which is a more benign version. And then you reinfect them like with a virus to get that into the cells. Now that has worked in, it is having promising results in some diseases like muscular dystrophy, where those vectors can just go to the muscles. I think muscular dystrophy is where it's having the most effect right now. It would be pretty hard in vascular EDS because it affects so many tissues in the body and a lot of those tissues don't have turnover, aren't being replaced all the time. Uh, I, I think it's, it's possible, but I think we're a long, a long way from there. What, I don't know, Shereen, if you've had thoughts or contemplations. Yeah, we, we've had the same conversation and the issue is, is the technology makes sense, but we need a better vector. And, and so that's what needs to be worked on is try to figure out how to deliver it. And exactly your point is correct. It's it, the tissue is everywhere in the body, and, and that makes it challenging. Great, thank you. Um, how do we? How can we determine what type of col three A one we are producing? Can I see that from the initial analysis report of my genetic test? So your genetic test will show what kind of mutation it is. It's usually in the report where it'll say this is a amino acid substitution or haplon sufficiency or splice site mutation. And I think this is why it's very important to talk to a geneticist to interpret the actual report. Uh, sometimes it just comes and it looks like it's Greek, but uh, but it's nice to have somebody that can explain that to you. Exactly. Um, Shane, you talked a lot about ciliprolol. Um, mm -hmm. is, that, is that a beta blocker? It is a beta blocker. So it's, there's a whole lot of beta blockers. The ones that are more commonly used are metoprolol and atenolol. Those are ones we use really commonly in Marfan syndrome. And there's sort of three classes of beta blockers. There's the, very, the, the early ones that sort of cause the lower blood pressure and the lower heart rate, but they could actually cause constriction of the peripheral vessels. Then there's the second generation, which sort of had a low blood pressure, low heart rate, but didn't cause that constriction. And then the third generation, for, through a variety of mechanisms, actually potentially can have dilation of the peripheral vessels. And in theory, we think that's probably better for patients that have vascular EDS. Um, so, so that's why sort of, sort of we're leaning towards those third generations. But we don't have a ton of data yet. Okay. Um, for adults with a history of dissections but who can't have MRIs, how often should they receive um, CTA scans? So CT, for aortic dissection in general, we scan people at one month, six months, and annually thereafter, after the dissection. Um, if I am worried that there may be that, what we call aneurysmal degeneration, so the reason we scan is because we're looking to see if the dissection now has turned into an aneurysm and it's getting larger. And so if I am concerned about growth rates, then I would recommend every six months. I do try to alternate specifically for the radiation risk between CT and MRI, but if we cannot get um, MRIs, then it will be CT. There are low-dose radiation CT scans, and there are ways to minimize the radiation risk, and then we work with our radiologists to do that. Great. Thank you. Um, here's a specific drug question. Um, somebody's daughter, um, the doctor uses a tenolol because she has POTS. Is that okay? Or is that too specific a question? You need to know the daughter's situation. 
I mean, I would think it's okay. I don't know if we have really good data between a second, uh, a tunnel is a second generation beta blocker. I don't, we, I don't think we have excellent data between second and third generation cephalosporins. So I don't think there's anything wrong with prescribing a tunnel. Okay, great. I think you guys did a really great job in talking about um, dissection versus um, aneurysm and ruptures. Um, but it's a question here about um, does an enlargement in the aorta cause weakness in the vessel? And if so, does that increase the risk for an aneurysm? Like, so does it enlarge? What's the relationship between the enlargement, the tearing, and then the bulging? So the, the bulging and the enlargement are a marker of a weak aortic wall. So the weakness happens first, and then the aorta starts dilating. And the bigger it gets, the more tension it's putting on the wall. And that's why when they get big enough, that's when a rupture happens, similar to a balloon. If you keep blowing up a balloon, eventually it'll pop. And, and so that's why there are, we use the size, we look at the size of the aneurysm and to decide if we need to fix it or not. So not all aneurysms need to be fixed, uh, but certainly aneurysms that are growing fairly quickly between study to study, or if they reach a certain size parameter, then we fix them. We don't have size parameters for vascular EDS, predominantly because the, what we have, even these cases that we have published on, we don't have imaging on everybody to know how big the aneurysms were before they ruptured. Uh, so that's one of the things that's missing in our knowledge of vascular EDS. Okay, thank you. A couple of people have more questions about medications. They're a little bit personal, so I just want to tell those two people that we'll get back to you separately on those. I just want to move on to a little bit of a different topic here. Um, somebody wants to know if there's a connection between um, psychiatric diagnoses such as depression and beds. Well, I mean, I, got, I, I can talk about it in kids. Um, I don't know if there is a medical connection, but certainly, at least for me, any child with a chronic health condition, both based on how people treat them externally and based on this fear that you're not like other kids or this feeling that you're not like other kids, that I see a, I, I see anxiety and depression pretty commonly. It's certainly not universal, but higher than in the normal population. But I don't think it's necessarily that VEDS causes it, but I think it, it can be hard feeling like you're different, especially when you're a, a, usually this is my adolescent. So come to conference. You'll meet everybody else like you. You'll feel well supported. <laughs> <laughs> um, can't help it. Sorry. Um, here's somebody wants to know if um, thinning hair, if you've ever seen thinning hair as a um, associated with beds. That's actually quite common, and it is one of the one of the. Um, it's not listed as a as a criteria, but it is something we look for when we're working on diagnosing people. So it tends to be thinning hair, very fine hair, and then maybe receding hairline as well. Uh, so that's not uncommon. That's interesting. Um, what about a collagen supplement? Could that help? Um, I don't think it does because the way it digests and absorbs into your body, it, it doesn't work that way. And that's one of the other challenges. So that's where the vitamin C, and I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but the thought behind vitamin C supplementation is that it encourages the cells to, to expel or produce more of that collagen uh, so that it's secreting more collagen. So vitamin C rather than collagen supplements. Um, do, do all of VEDS patients have hypertension or are you just putting them on beta blockers to, for protection? Just for, at least for me, like in kids, we almost no one has hypertension. We're doing it for protection, and that's the same mantra as we use in Marfan syndrome. Most of them do not have hypertension, but we're using it prophylactically. Now, Shereen can speak to adults because I think it's a lot more common, but in kids, it's very uncommon to have hypertension, but we use it anyway, and they tolerate it very well. In adults, there is some hypertension, but not, I wouldn't say it's an exceptional number. Um, so if they have, you know, if there's any hypertension, then I aggressively treat it. The other thing is they may not have hypertension, but even if the blood pressure is 130, which is considered the upper end of normal or, you know, anything over 130 is hypertension, I try to keep people in the 110 range. So I try to bring them even lower than what a normal person would be. Right. And Shane, at what age do you recommend starting the beta blocker as soon as they're diagnosed? I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, the side effects are minimal. We've been using beta blockers and even infants for uh, over 50 years in cardiology and they tolerate it really well and sort of there's different perspectives on this so so I don't represent all pediatric cardiologists or people who treat this but one of the perspectives is we'll wait till they're at risk and then start the medicines but from my perspective and this is again goes back to Marfan syndrome we feel like if you're helping the structural integrity if you're if you're limiting the stress to the vessels over time, that that helps, and that probably takes plenty of years of protecting the vessels other than just doing it when you're at risk. I think it's a chronic disease and you're having chronic damage to the vessels, and if you can be protected early, I personally started early, and we definitely see that in our other patient populations that the patients that start earlier have less severe manifestations. 
For me, on my end, if somebody has an aneurysm or dissection, then yes, absolutely, I think they should be on a medication. Um, if they do not and they're asymptomatic and there's really no aneurysms or dissection, then we have this discussion. We go over the, um, the lipid all data and then make that decision together. Great, thank you. Um, do, just, do dissections fully heal or do they continue to be a risk even several years later? Some dissections can heal and some dissections will continue to be a risk. And so whenever a dissection happens, we have to follow it. I've seen some healing, for, for example, in internal carotid arteries and vertebral arteries, uh, when we see dissections in those arteries, they tend to heal. Uh, arteries elsewhere, for example, like the iliac arteries, they tend to not heal. And it's really not understood why that happens, uh, but it can be variable depending on the location. Great, thank you. Um, how often do you see mixed connective tissue disorders like Marfan and beds? Oh, uh, I've never, I've never seen that. I mean, I, I've. I have one patient who has Marfan syndrome and Turner syndrome, but um, never I've never seen Marfan in beds. Okay, I've never seen it either. I mean, I suppose it could be luck of the draw like anything else, right? It would be really rare. What about within the same family? I hear sometimes people say, I have this and my son has that. I mean, is that, you think somebody's just misdiagnosed or is not showing yet? And they really Probably. have the same thing? Well, someone, certainly hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos is so common. You can certainly have someone with hypermobile EDS in any of these rare things, but it would be, it, it's certainly possible, but it would be very uncommon for like a parent to have Marfan syndrome and the daughter to have vascular EDS. Like right. that's probably that someone's been misdiagnosed. Right, okay. There are several, thank you, thank you for answering those questions. There are several more and we will follow up with you guys. Um, we are gonna be sending out an email in the next two days, which will have the link to the recording, which will be on our website. And so you can watch this again, listen to these questions and answers and um, share it with people. And um, like I said, we'll also get back to the questions that were not answered, and the nurse in our help center will address those and ask Shane and Shereen for help as needed on that. Um, I wanted to, um, before we end this hour, I wanted to let you know that our next webinar in this series um, you may be interested in as well. Um, Dr. Ron Lackrow from Boston Children's Hospital is going to be talking about children's heart issues and Marfan, Lowy Seats, and Beds. And that's um, April 9th at 7 o'clock Eastern. So hopefully you'll be able to um, participate in that as well. Um, just go to our website, marfan.org, patients and families. And then on the side, you'll see virtual medical symposium series. So all the recordings are located there as well for this and our other webinars. And if you have additional questions that you did not ask tonight, you can always contact Jan in our Help and Resource Center. She is a wealth of knowledge and she's connected to all these amazing doctors. So Anything that she does not know, she reaches out and she will fully answer you. Um, you can reach her. Um, here's her phone number. Best place really is to go to ask a question at uh, marfan.org, and that goes right to Jan, and she can systematically get to your question and give her a chance because after a webinar like this, there are a lot of questions. Um, but she is really happy to help you um, with answer all your questions. So um, I want to thank you um, all again for participating tonight. Thank you to Shireen and Shane for your time tonight and Michael for joining us as well. And um, we'll be doing more on beds. We do hope to see you all at our conference this summer. And um, as Shereen said, we will be doing a webinar later this year, really focusing on surgery related to beds. So any other suggestions that you have, feel free to email me. Um, I'll be sending you the email with the follow-up and you can certainly reply and let me know what you think and your other ideas. So thank you all very much and have a good night. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Very welcome. And thank you for everybody else who was listening. Yes.